11 in four parts deals with the four great artists of the late Sung, of the late Southern Sung period, whom I take to be towering figures. Well, maybe Ma Lin is a towering figure, but a very good artist, and the other three are at least. Um, and this is, they make up for me one of the great ages of, uh, of, of painting and world art, and one that I think has been basically neglected. We haven't given as much attention to these artists as they really deserve, largely because of the strong negative reaction against them of the Chinese uh, scholar artists, the literati in the Yuan Dynasty and later, who tended to put them down. Xiao Gui, one of them, received, did receive some favorable attention from the later critics. Dong Xi Chang, the Ming critic and artist, uh, had said some good things about Xiao Gui. But for the most part, um, they weren't, as I say, given really, really given much credit. The big guns, the big critics, instead turned their attention to mm, Dung Yuan and Zhu Ran and uh, Li Chang, you know, those somewhat shadowy or elusive 10th century artists I talked about in one of the earlier lectures, uh, whose works are scarcely to be seen in, in originals, except in copies and schoolworks. Um, I would like to see those appraisals reconsidered and more attention uh, given to these uh, four artists I'm going to be talking about now on the basis of surviving paintings and much more weight given to these four masters. The first of them, Ma Yuan, is perhaps the easiest to like, uh, and he's been so much imitated uh, in his own time and later that it's almost impossible to co construct an oeuvre for him, a body that is of extant work, but I'll try to. Lecture 11 will be about four major masters of the um, of the later Southern Song period, Ma Yuan and Xiao Gui, Ma Yuan Sun Ma Lin, and uh, Liang Kai, who will make a kind of bridge to the last lecture on Chan or Zen painting, since he begins as an academy master and, and becomes a Chan painter, so goes the story anyway. All right, I'll begin, I'll start out by um, uh, showing a picture of my old colleague and friend Richard Edwards, or Dick Edwards, and crediting him with uh, some very fine writing on the subject of today's lecture. Dick Edwards, now retired after teaching for many years at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, uh, with important writings on Southern Soviet Academy painting to his credit. Uh, he planned a great exhibition of that material, which was never carried out, but he did important writing on the period and as artists with special insights. Um, he wrote a book also uh, uh, titled The World Around the Chinese Artist, Aspects of Realism in Chinese Painting, Ann Arbor 1987, which is to be recommended. Uh, now reportedly he has a book in press on the first artist that we're going to treat today, that is Ma Yuan. I should add that a special, a major exhibition of Southern Song painting is planned by the National Palace Museum in Taipei for the fall of 2010, the year we're just now entering. This will be a follow-up to its uh, major exhibition of Northern Song painting that was held last year, which I referred to briefly in my lecture when I was talking about Li Tong. Uh, okay, <clears throat> uh, another piece of fascinating and rec highly recommended reading for uh, the life in the city of Hangzhou in the 13th century at the end of the Song, uh, with a lot of um, interesting information on the academy and on painting. That is, a book by Jacques Gernet, uh, translated, of course, into English, French scholar, Jacques, G-E-R-N-E-T, Daily Life in China on the Eve of the Mongol Invasion, 1250 to 1276, Stanford University Press, 1962. This is based on a lot of translations from Chinese texts because quite many of them uh, survive from this period and slightly later, which tell about life in Hangzhou. That is, uh, people after the dynasty has fallen like to write retrospectively and nostalgically about what it was like. So we have a lot of writing of that kind. And Jernet has, uh, by translating this and bringing it together, has produced a really fascinating book. We wish we had more like that. Okay. Now, this, uh, we're going to be talking, that is, uh, now about the 
I already put the first uh, two slides, the first two slides on, please. This is a painting attributed to Maryam, which I leave on so you look at it. Uh, the the hole and the detail at the right. These are both slides from reproductions. Uh, as I'm talking about Maryam, the Ma Xia School, as it's called, named after Maryam and Xiaogui. Chinese like these two character phrases to designate schools like Li Guo for Li Chong and Gua Xi and so on. The Ma Xia School was once the most popular of all schools of Chinese painting in the West. I don't think it's that now, but it certainly was, um, partly because of the uh, popularity of these artists in Japan, where some of their works are well preserved, and um, uh, the writer, early writer on Chinese and Japanese art, Fenelosa, Ernest Fenelosa, uh, transmitted this taste to the West. Uh, anyway, um, Maran's fan-shaped album leaf, which you're going to see, Landscape of the Billows in the Boston Museum of Fine Arts, was, as I recall, reproduced in Books on World Art as the single example of Chinese painting. It was the Chinese painting everybody seemed to know. Immediately accessible. Uh, immediately, immediately likable, that is. Um, well, this represents the culmination of that transformation of the Li Tong landscape type into something smaller scale, more poetic, warmer in tone, idealized, which we saw in talking about followers of Li Tong and that took place in the Hangzhou Academy. Now there are two main figures, as I say, Ma Yuan and Xia Gui, and then Ma Yuan's son Ma Lin was often added as the third, as I will do. Ma Yuan was the fourth generation in a family of painters within the Academy. Uh, the others, although there are works associated with them, don't concern us. I could talk about them, but uh, I didn't. Ma Yuan served in the Academy in the late 12th, early 13th century, became very famous. Uh, we have no dated work of his, so any speculation about priority has to be only that. And I'm not going to try to do that. Uh, he, there were so many close followers of Ma Yuan and later imitations that the problem of deciding which are really his is complicated. I'm not going to try that. Uh, maybe a few suggestions. I'm gonna, I'll do it more for Xia Gui, where I think it makes more sense. Anyway, Mai Ren, as you'll we'll see, specialized in simple lyrical pictures, rather like the Yen brothers than we saw before, but departing more from the Li Tong model. He's a more original artist. He gave the tradition that uh, Yibian, or one twist, as the Chinese put it, as a, sending it off in a different, sorry, slightly different, a somewhat different direction. Okay, Mai Ren now, uh, uh, active around 1190 to 1230. And what we're looking at now is a painting only attributed to him in the Seikado Private Museum in Tokyo, great family collection behind it, uh, Landscape and Storm. Um, in other words, been in Japan for a long time, as much of what we're seeing has been. Uh, reproduced in various books, Seren's Lore, and so on. Um, this is a painting good to begin with because it's still close to the Litong Manor in some respects. It's uh, rather dark on silk without, without much color. Uh, this uh, repro this uh, slide from reproduction or image from a reproduction makes it clearer than it is in the original. Um, from the Li Tong Manor, certainly, you can see is the silhouette of the trees. Something in the construction of the mountains is still uh, Li Tong Manor. The needle peaks, the one that sort of split off at the left. Uh, and a few other things. The main area of the picture in the center is occupied by uh, foliage, leafy trees, and a uh, marvelous pine tree which sticks up into the wind and rain like the prow of a ship, as I think I remember once writing or dramatically. Uh, swashes of ink coming down from upper right to lower left uh, suggest a, a rainstorm. And of course, the blowing of the trees and of the of the of, of, uh, vines from the uh, hanging from the pine tree. Now down below, we see a boat moored, and then a figure with, under a parasol making his way up the path, arriving that is at a uh, temple, which is in the middle left. We can see it very clearly here. So this is not 
not an uncommon theme. We've seen quite a number of pictures of people in landscapes arriving at temples. So the idea of arriving, I'll speak of that later, arriving, uh, uh, coming, ho coming home late, that kind of thing is very important in southern stone painting generally. What we have here is is something, as I say, much much more dramatic, uh, a dramatic function given to the trees, to the uh, uh, the rainstorm, a more calculated planning of the composition, and more for effect. That is less nat not so much ma nature seen for itself now, objectively as a northern song, but nature used for an expressive purpose, given an emotional tone even you might say subjected to a certain manipulation if you want to be negative about it. Okay, uh, so much for my, 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 this painting by Mahiran. A very fine painting, a huge rock, by the way, uh, in the foreground, uh, which uh, left foreground, which I didn't mention. But, oh, I won't speak of that because I don't have good details. Now, let's go on to the next one. Okay, here is a quite wonderful Mahiran painting, which I'm ready to say is really by... Ma Yuan, titled Man Quit by Lamplight. Um, this is, a, uh, is not signed. Uh, the good version of it, which I and most people now take to be the real version, uh, is, was simply cataloged in the Imperial Collection as Anonymous Sung. And you find it reproduced in the 3000 Years book, Chinese Art Treasures, and so on and so on. Okay. Um, Another version of it, uh, which I'll put it on in a little bit, which has a Mahiran signature, reproduced by Lurer, I think he got it wrong, um, is, uh, uh, was, uh, well, well, I'll talk about that when we come to it anyway. Uh, this, the good version here, let me read from the, um, from the inscription at the top, written by the Emperor Ningzong. He's at Min Ningzong, you know. Okay, here he goes. Um, well, written by an unidentified writer, it says here. Um, the, the, the translation of the inscription is in the Chinese Art Treasures exhibition. It goes, quote, Back from court, pages proclaim imperial summons. Father and son, serving together, are honored to attend a banquet. Wine is offered in Iguan's goblet. and We pray for great blessings. Music is heard in the Han Palace. We are stirred by joyful sound. Of prunus buds and precious vases, a thousand branches are opening in colored lanterns of jade and coral. Ten thousand lamps are shining, and so on. Um, well, it's, it shows, in other words, a banquet happening in a palace seen from outside. And we look at it. Uh, we don't actually see the guests. Uh, we see the interior of the palace a little bit glimpsed. And we see um, dancers and m musicians uh, women holding lutes, uh, seen through the. Here, let's go on to the details. Here, yes, here the the, the um, uh, horizontal detail, uh, seen through the bare branches of the plum trees in the foreground. It's an evening scene, dusky. Um, quite a wonderful painting, and uh, mysterious, and uh, subtle. Now, um, uh, Li Hui Shu very good writer who, a uh, scholar who teaches at uh, UCLA now. She wrote uh, in, in her writings on, on the Southern Sun Court painting, which she's done very fine writing on a She tried to identify the actual event that this picture reproduces. She may be right. I'm not, I'm not uh, going to argue it one way or the other. Um, but uh, anyway, you should, you should read that too. So um, here, getting in closer, you see the Here's a detail, a vertical detail. And you see these quite wonderful uh, bare uh, plum trees in the foreground. And through them, a group of musicians uh, seen playing their lutes and maybe uh, not, not dancing exactly. Anyway, entertaining. And then inside, servitors, uh, uh, m m uh, servants uh, standing in servile positions, b bowing and uh, looking toward the right where the guests are going to be seated. And uh, you see some light inside the palace and so on. And then outside beyond is uh, dusky areas with more blossoming plum trees. And then a wonderful distance, uh, 
seen above and so on, a, a huge pine tree sticking up into the uh, mist dramatically. And then in the left, just distant, distant open space, a few mountain peaks at the right. Okay, that's the good version. Now, interestingly, here, let's put beside it. This is the painting that is actually signed Ma Yuan, and which was once taken to be the real one. Now, um, interesting, interestingly, by the way, this is the one that went to the Great London Exhibition of 1935-36. And as I've said in other contexts, the Chinese Selection Committee that sent the paintings from the China, by the Chinese government, uh, I believe, sent deliberately the wrong paintings for the early periods. They're all the wrong Ma Yuan, the wrong Xiao Gui, and the wrong uh, Guo Xi, and so on. But this time, <laughs> by good luck for people, uh, they made a mistake. I mean, they thought this was the real one, so they sent the other one. And in fact, they sent the good one by mistake. Okay, that's another story again. Um, now, uh, what, what is wrong with this? What is obviously wrong? Well, several things. Uh, the, the artist doesn't feel confident enough, enough to try to paint the dancing figures seen through the trees, which is quite subtle and beautiful. Instead, he stops the trees further down and paints the dancers on the terrace outside the palace separately, and then so forth. But the main thing is that the upper part is filled, as you see. Here we have filling, filling in the space, uh, more, more um, heavy, heavily drawn mountains, and buildings, palace buildings in the distance, and pine trees. In other words, he couldn't bear to leave that space open. And this is characteristic, as we would see if we went further, of, Ming painting, ground Ming painting actually. Now here is, let's see, here this, uh, we, put, we can put beside it, now do put this at the left for the moment. Uh, this is a painting uh, from the early Yuan dynasty by an artist named Sun Jun Sa, painting I once owned myself now, like my daughter Sarah. At any rate, uh, in our museum and reproduced in my book on Yuan painting and so forth. But you see, uh, this is very much in the Mao Yuan manner with the Mairan style rocks and pine trees and dramatic diagonal composition. But the upper part is not so empty. It features a further passage with massive rocky bluff and uh, a stream flowing and so forth going up. And then next, please, here's a painting by the artist Dai Jin of the Ming Dynasty, well-known painting, returning late from a spring outing, still with a lot of the Mairan manner there, the dramatic pine tree and the composition and so on, but again, a great heavy, uh, what, hillside and temple and so on in the upper part. Ming artists simply could not resist, as I say, filling their paintings in this way, but we can make the, make the distinction and get what I think is the right one, now, uh, get the painting right. Now let's go back to this uh, picture, uh, this wonderful original again. Put on, please, the original and the uh, detail. So it's a painting that shows uh, a particular event, whether it can be identified or not, and it shows it as, as if we were sort of disembodied observers, not really participants, seen from a distance uh, observing this event. And it was done certainly in response to the, the poem. Okay, a, a wonderful work which most people are willing to take as the real Ma Yuan, certainly I am. Now going on, here, uh, here is a black and white reproduction uh, image. I don't have a slide of the uh, image of the original in color. Uh, this is a painting that is often or sometimes reproduced in China as a work of Ma Yuan when they are publishing a book on Song painters or whatever. Uh, this is the painting which they will bring in to represent Ma Yuan. It's signed. Uh, it's the landscape with dancing peasants in the Palace Museum in Beijing. I reproduced this in my Lyric Journey book, but only to explain why it isn't the real thing. Um, now, as you'll see, uh, first of all, the subject, the subject, the peasants down below are returning from a um, from a um, uh, an evening of drinking and so on and dancing as they as they go, and then beyond that, the big rocks and a willow tree, a bare willow tree, and plum tree, and so on. And then in the distance, too much, much too much. Uh, here a detail, oh here are the peasants, okay. And you see them, uh, rather uh, rustic looking people, 
one of them pushed by his servant, and the old man on the other side is still dancing. I say they're coming home from a, some kind of drinking party, and um, a very nicely drawn bamboo and big rock and so on. Or here, uh, still closer up. Yeah, this is well, it's Mayan, but this is the figures. Mayan, but Mayan a little too heavy-handed, really. I think for Mayan and a little maybe too active. I don't know. Possibly there may, may well have been a Mayan painting of this kind behind it, but now lost, I think. Anyway, next, the um, here's the upper part of it with the, as I say, overly filled in uh, uh, distance. Um, with pine, tall pine trees and lots of buildings and a kind of gallery built around the cliff here at the right and so forth. Okay, uh, it's as a mistakenly, as I say, uh, credited with being a real Mayan and much reproduced. It might seem that I'm being what, especially hard on Chinese colleagues uh, in these lectures, but that's only because I'm talking about Southern Song paintings, which uh, the Chinese um, uh, collectors and writers and so on have traditionally downplayed, and I think undervalued. It's not, not by any means their strong area. If I were talking about Yuan Ming or Qing painting, on the other hand, I'd be paying constant tributes to C.C. Wang, my old friend, and others for their reattributions and their discoveries. It's where they're particularly strong. They can read the hand of the artist, they can recognize painters, they can, yeah, and so forth. Well, nobody has it all right. Certainly not myself, or it may sound sometimes as if I think I did, anyway. Now let's go on with Mauran, having said that. Okay, here is one of two very famous Mauran paintings in the Boston Museum of Fine Arts. Here I have really good original slides and I can show them. Two um, fan-shaped album leaves, originally fan paintings, both on silk, ink on silk. Um, this is the one, Landscape with Willows and a Returning Farmer. This is, oh, so familiar, so classical, that it once was, as I say, the painting that would be reproduced to represent Chinese painting. Uh, when we put it on the screen in a symposium that I organized way back the beginning of our field getting together, so to speak, everybody kind of what, groaned, and, and nobody really wanted to talk about it because it was too familiar. Okay, uh, almost too lovely to be um, to, to, to be talked about. But at any rate, um, it's a very beautiful painting, and, and we shouldn't put it down. Okay, um, it's, um, it's, a scene, it's a scene, as I say, with willow trees and distant hills. One of the things you see immediately is that everything in the painting, or a lot of things in the painting, sort of echo the shape of the fan, and that's characteristic of Mauryan pictures uh, that are in, in the uh, fan painting shape, um, of which this is a great example. Um, the, the farmer, we'll see a detail in a minute, down in the lower right is uh, returning with his hoe over his shoulder. He's making his way uh, uh, through the, between the willow trees, across a bridge, and eventually to his house or in a cluster of houses here, seen in the lower left. I'll have details. And then this wonderful uh, uh, crest of the hill up above with very little texturing, uh, maybe a little bit of blue color. I may be wrong about it being an ink only. It looks as if, no, I'm not sure about that. Anyway, it's uh, typically, it's, it's usually said to be ink only. At any rate, now let's go on to some details. Here, uh, just a minute. Yes. Okay, here's the, uh, a um, detail of the lower part, a figure of the farmer, as I say, with his, um, with his uh, uh, it's actually a, a hoe, I guess, and it looks like a wine gourd, something tied onto it, making his way, looking rather tired, across, through the landscape, into the, uh, across the bridge to coming home at night, the evening scene. Well, there are lots of paintings of people returning, and I'll speak about those later in this lecture as part of a whole program. Here you can see, by the way, the uh, damage in the middle part going up vertically where the spine of the fan was. And very beautiful drawing of willows uh, repeating the curves of each other and of the shape. Uh, next, please. So here's the uh, picture of the, uh, here's the detail of the lower part, the farmer uh, uh, and the willow tree above him, tiny figure in a large landscape. 
something of a, it looks like a, a, a plum tree beyond that. These are standard features, in, and here, still closer, is the um, is a, is a detail. It's one a bit of a large bit of damage you can see there just in front of the farmer. But generally, the leaf is in good shape, and it is, as I say, a little a little masterwork of of uh, Mumaliran. And here, a detail of the lower left, which is um, uh, with the willow tree in the foreground, the bridge, and then the uh, house that is the destination of our farmer and trees beyond. Um, very lovely, very uh, very uh, uh, romantic, you might say. If you're probably okay to use the word, I would I would use it anyway. Yeah. Um, all right. Um, put let's put beside it the other one, uh, the other which is simply black and black and white slide. I don't have any details, unfortunately. The other one in the Boston Museum of Fine Arts, representing two men beneath blossoming plum trees. I had this one in my Southern Sung exhibition. Uh, both of them, as I say, fan paintings, both of them signed works of Ma Yuan, and both of them accepted generally as his genuine works. Let me speak a bit about this type um, <coughs> before going on. Uh, in these pictures, space and depth are not achieved, as you can see, by the difficult means that were used by northern Sung landscapists, that is, diagonal recessions, vistas along river valleys, that kind of thing. This is like a small passage from maybe a work of Guashi or somebody, with uh, repoussoir trees, space opening behind the willow picture, and so on. One moves uh, from a clearly defined uh, area to a, a misty or simply uh, uh, what uh, uh, something done in, in silhouette, and then back to further mist and so on. The pictures are done in planes, that is, no continuous recession. This is a formula, but a very effective formula. Um, but going from northern Sung to this is something like going from, let's say, Beethoven to Chopin. Uh, these are more like, say, a Chopin prelude. Wonderful works in themselves, but smaller scale and not so sort of overpoweringly, uh, you know, massive. I was listening recently to Chopin. Preludes again is played by the great, oh, short-lived, divinely gifted artist Dino Lepati. Uh, very moving. Okay. Anyway, um, they can be wonderful. But it was, what we're seeing, as I say, is, is the, not a come down exactly, but a, a semi-smaller scale, the really titanic feat of conquering certain problems, representational problems, developing techniques and expressive means, which we have been tracing in these lectures, gives way now to a more confident use of them, to an easy and seemingly effortless manipulation of devices that have been well absorbed and seem common property. Once this is done, of course, any Maoran imitator can do it. I referred to him in Xia Gui when I ended my old article on rocks and early Chinese painting, a very early article for me, uh, without showing their works. I, I, I spoke of them as, I wrote of them as, quote, like members of a younger generation spending lightly a hard-won heritage. In other words, their heritage, which came from Fun Quan through Li Tong and so on, uh, is now being sort of used lightly. Maybe that's a bit too negative, especially for Xia Gui, I wouldn't write that way today. Well, I don't mean to diminish their originality in any way. Looking now at this picture, of which, as I say, I don't have any details of the two men, it's, again, quite beautifully arranged in relation to the frame, the curve of the hill um, uh, behind them, the curve, obviously, of the two figures uh, confronting each other or facing each other across space. I used the phrase once like... Uh, like parentheses and closing nothing. Their um, servant, as usual, standing over on the left and sort of gazing off somewhere as if he's not interested. And this quite wonderful plum tree, old old tree, which uh, arches over them and, and, and the shapes of the plum tree uh, frame the figures. As you see, above each figure is a kind of little arch-like thing in the tree. Well, it's artificial but quite, quite wonderfully artificial. Okay, now this is not to write of them and talk about them this way is not to 
diminish their originality. Maduran is a thoroughly original painter, but his originality lies in creating a new entrancing mode of painting. No single painting seems to reveal the kind of grappling with difficult formal and representational problems we've seen in others. Everything seems to be at his disposal, used for distinct purposes. There's a kind of perfection here, not so much rightness, that is a term I used before, rightness with, re with respect to nature, uh, li or natural order, as I was talked in, uh, used in talking about northern Sung landscape, rather an aesthetic, technical perfection. Southern Sung Academy paintings give the impression that they were conceived whole and executed without a moment of faltering. Everything in place, nothing could be changed. Nothing that seems arbitrary or accidental, and the, the outcome is, of course, a loss of that naturalness that we feel in northern Sung painting, to a point. Uh, the kinds that we see, for instance, in the Great Hand Scroll, attributed to Xu Dao Ning in Kansas City with its ta shaggy, tangled trees and its odd outcroppings and, and hillocks and so on. Now, everything doesn't seem sort of natural and ordained, preordained in that picture by any means. So it's a total change. Well, okay, the two men under the pine tree here are symbolic, but also, uh, also they they uh, em they show they embody this in their very forms, facing each other, a kind of rounded angularity, a beauty of line, uh, everything perfectly related to the frame. As I say, we will see this pairing of figures a number of times in painting, and then. In a, a, a tiny detail on a Xiaogui scroll, we see two figures confronting each other. All right, okay. Now let's go on. Uh, another, two more actually very fine Ma Yuan pictures, signed works that are generally accepted. In the, these in the Palace Museum in Taipei, horizontal album leaves with couplets, uh, poetic couplets to which the artist was uh, was required to respond with a picture. One of them here representing walking on a mountain path in spring. I had this mascara book, Chinese art treasures, and so on. And the other I'll show in a minute. Well, the addition of the figure, uh, the large figure to the landscape, uh, really, in a sense, reduces the interest of the scenery. The scenery, in a sense, becomes the setting for the figure or what he contemplates or experiences around him. It doesn't have the same objective existence, that is, as early landscape attempts to have. The figure is very conscious of his surroundings. I say his because, alas, it's mostly he, very seldom women, occasionally women, but I, I, I'm not uh, showing that kind of painting. There may be very few from early periods. Yes, there are a few. I've, I've, I have shown them. Okay, anyway. The figure stands in a posture that is expressive of his responses. Um, and that again sets this off, certainly, from northern Sung painting, early painting. The enjoyment of nature becomes the very theme of the work, and nature around him seems put there for his enjoyment. Okay, here the man is out walking with his servant behind him, carrying the chin, this musical instrument, suggesting he's going to sit down at some point and play it. And um, the, uh, the leaves of uh, the poetry says, I'm doing it from memory, Brushed by the wind, by the mist leaves, the uh, the uh, branches, something dance in the wind, is it? And then fleeing from his from the person coming, the uh, wild birds, the wilderness birds, don't finish their songs, and you see the two birds up in the sky. So the artist has this couplet to uh, by some imperial hand to illustrate, and he does it, and he does it very beautifully. The um, Distant hills here on the upper left, as you see, echoing in some ways the shape of the willow, which frames him uh, very beautifully, artificially, if you will. Um, and he uh, uh, occupies very, uh, very uh, uh, powerfully the whole, uh, the the whole, the whole composition, dominates it. Here is the figure, and he stands, one hand raised. He's watching the birds fly away. He's responding, responding visibly and uh, rather dramatically to his surroundings. And um, uh, it has a sense of the momentary, but it's, it's just more in the poem and so on, uh, implied uh, the, uh, the uh, dancing of, or uh, 
of the of the bushes as he goes by and so on. And here is up above the very beautifully painted willow branch and the two birds in white with little bits of white color. What kind of birds, I don't know. Now the other one of this pair, as it's usually taken to be, uh, is uh, through snowy mountains at dawn. And here, um, here the uh, uh, the it's like the Lee D pictures that we saw in a previous lecture. Um, two paintings by the uh, Academy artist Lee D with figures in wintry landscapes coming home. That's what's happening here. Um, it uh, it's a wood gatherer in this case, a gatherer of firewood, who has been up uh, in the mountains gathering the wood and burning it to make uh, ch charcoal that is can be used for in braziers and so on in the city. So now he's taking it down uh, to sell and over his shoulder he carries a pole with a pheasant that he has caught in a snare, presumably. Um, okay, this is again a, a theme familiar. You see, by the way, that kind of rough drawn shoreline, which I pointed out in a painting attributed to Li Tong. And on the left, a quite beautifully drawn, uh, big, heavy brush strokes uh, suggesting the curving uh, side of the uh, of the slope of earth. And in the upper part, trees and so on, and a beautiful uh, blossoming, or about to blossom plum tree on the right, which sets the wintry uh, theme. Um, it's significant that, and the, the, the wood gatherer, as he walks, uh, heavily clothed, is blowing on his on his hands, keep warm. Uh, he's feeling the cold, that is. It's significant, I think, that scholars and aristocrats in these paintings never shiver. They don't get rained on. Uh, all the less pleasant aspects of nature affect only the lower classes, not them. So here, oh yeah, I have the detail of it here. Um, well, not really much to say. Great skill, rather heavy brush line, lively figure, but very conventional figure. The mule uh, plodding, uh, what? patiently along, and the um, uh, the uh, sticks of the uh, partly burned sticks that he's taking back to sell. Okay, next please. Now, this is a oh, very beautiful leaf in the Shanghai Museum, fan-shaped leaf, an evening landscape with buildings and a tall, well, uh, 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 and, and, uh, and uh, willow trees protruding up into the into the evening sky, uh, yellow, uh, a, a, well, a palace or temple buildings, whatever they are on the lower part here, and um, no figures in this case, and if I have another in the moment, which there are figures, distant hills and a beautifully rendered uh, sky with a moon far up in the upper right. So this is a, a twilight picture. Um, this is a favorite time of day for Southern Sung painters, and it, it inspires a kind of speculation. Um, this lateness uh, is, is an important theme in, in a lot of painting, lateness and returning. Um, these were people who were living and working in a sheltered enclave who were maybe conscious, must have been conscious, of the impending end of their security. Well, there's a famous poetic couplet that uh, most literate Chinese know the beauty of the evening sky, but somehow foretelling the coming of night. I should add before going on that the Shanghai Museum, which owns this painting, now catalogs it as a work by Ma Yuan Sun Ma Lin. Uh, there is a partly cut off signature at the lower left edge, reading Chun, your subject, Ma, and then the given name is missing. Uh, the Shanghai Museum people must have decided that the missing character is Lin, I would still vote for Ma Yuan because this seems to me to match better his style and there are other related paintings by him anyway. But I leave the question open. Okay, the next, please. Let's put these on side by side. This one is in the uh, Boston Museum of Fine Arts. And uh, in this case, a similar theme, but an evening sky with evening clouds, a kind of late sunset and distant peaks in the Maliran Manor. This, I think, is it a signed work? Signed work, I don't remember. I think this is the one I reproduced in my Lyric Journey book. 
And here on the terraces, you see one uh, gentleman in the upper uppermost uh, standing at the railing and looking outward, a screen behind him in part of a building. And then below, just to the right of the stairs, two more figures. Anyway, on this terrace in, in the evening. Um, let me read from the uh, my, my, my book titled The Lyric Journey. I, I reproduced this picture in color, the one on the right, the square album leaf, and wrote about it. Quote, A sense of the unconsummated pervades these Southern Song Academy-style pictures, along with a piercing feeling of lateness and loss. They may seem to portray courtly pleasures, but what they mostly suggest are pleasures past or anticipated or incipient, never to be fully realized. And then I quote writers on Chinese poetry, Dore Levy and Stephen Owen about uh, Tang poetry, where they get this. Uh, in another sign painting, fan painting by Molly Ran, uh, similar in composition, anyway, okay, uh, well, whatever. And, and, I, and I go on saying, in like poems, the paintings can seem to dispel for a moment the sadness of not being able to, quote, hold back beauty, end quote, by embodying it in visible forms that enable one to recall the feelings that imagery of the same kind in nature had once aroused. It's in quotes, because that comes from my one of my favorite poets, Gerard Manley Hopkins, how to hold back beauty. Actually, it's broken. How to... Uh, anyway, never mind. Gerard Manley Hopkins. So this passage, by the way, in the my Lyric Journey book, let me say that this whole question of what is the real content of Southern Song Academy painting, especially Maoyan and Chagwe, but others too, uh, and there's this theme of lateness and loss and sadness um, that is dealt with much more fully and uh, than I can possibly do it here. And if I could make it a, I can't make recommendations, I can't make a requirements because you're not really my students in the old sense. But if I could make it a requirement, I would, that everybody read, get find a copy of The Lyric Journey. It is in a library. It's not, not an uncommon book. It's still in print, I think, Harvard University Press. Uh, pages 47 through 72 are about Southern Song Academy painter. Um, this uh, passage in The Lyric Journey deals much more fully than I can possibly do here. And I, I, would, I would really, really su uh, suggest or almost uh, require, if I could, that you get that and read it, because I can't, as I say, spell out all of that here. And it's done with much, much, uh, much greater detail and, and greater depth than I can manage here. Okay, the next, please. So here's a detail of the upper part of that. And you see these uh, needle peaks, distant peaks, distantly taken from Li Tong, and um, a, uh, the peak with pines on it, also from Li Tong, and palace buildings. This one may well be a copy of Molly Round or some later artist. It's a little bit hard, a little bit angular. Uh, the fan-shaped one uh, is maybe has, is more likely to be the real thing. As I say, there, the question of authenticity is scarcely workable. You can scarcely deal with it in the case of Molly Rand, simply because uh, there are uh, so many very good copies and imitations and so on. Um, and I don't know, I, 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 I at any rate wouldn't want to try to, uh, wouldn't want to try to write a book about genuine Marianne paintings, leave it for others to try. Um, okay, here, next please. This is a one of a pair of paintings that came to light in the hands of C.C. C. Wong while I was writing my scare book. And the other one, which shows I'm not, I don't have a, an image of it here, but it's a scholar and his servant uh, on the shore of a, but on the edge of a stream, looking at deer that are drinking, as I remember. Um, they're, they're quite fine paintings, and here, this one, the scholar is uh, on a terrace by a waterfall, gazing down into the river with his servant, signed Chun Maliran, as if done for the emperor, that is. Well, I don't know. I, I, I might still reproduce them, but I probably would choose something else. They're a little bit hard and angular. Um, the painting of the pine tree and so on. Um, they're fine, and, and I don't know. I'm, I'm not putting them down completely, and I'm not saying they're wrong, but uh, they, they might not be uh, exactly Maliran either. And here, next to it, here is a painting. I can't remember even what collection it's in. I think the Palace Museum in Taiwan. 
Okay, here the scholar stands alone on the terrace and gazes at this waterfall which drops down between two great bulging cliffs. Um, I, I, I promised to say something about gazing at the waterfall themes, and I've shown a number of them already. Uh, and I, now I guess is the right time to do it. My valued colleague and friend, uh, Marion Diamond, I hope she's still alive and well, she was a very powerful and effective professor and administrator. She was the director of the, of the science, science museum up above the campus and so on for a while. Marion Diamond wrote an article which was uh, reviewed in the Daily Californian, the, uh, the uh, campus newspaper. Uh, and I read that and carried it into class on a day when I was going to show paintings of gazing at the waterfall. What she wrote about was the effect of different ions in the air on the brain. The brain is her great theme. She wrote all kinds of things about the brain based on putting rats through mazes and watching them and so forth, that kind of thing. Well, she, uh, she wrote about the effect of negative ions and positive ions in the air. Negative ions uh, enhance uh, the operation of the brain, give you a sense of exhilaration, a kind of clarity and uh, positive uh, of, of, of effect, whereas positive ions in the air uh, is de are depressing to the brain um, and make you sort of listless and depressed. Okay, where do you find lots of negative ions in the air? At the base of waterfalls. So the Chinese knew what they were doing by standing around the base of the waterfall because the air was really exhilarating in a real scientific sense. Well, they didn't know this, but they, they were right, <laughs> as, as usual, without early on. Um, and uh, where do you find uh, high concentrations of positive ions uh, which are depressing in front in front of computers, in front of computer screens? So my, my conclusion was that people who um, spend a lot of time in front of computers should get away each day and go and gaze at a waterfall. Okay, um, uh, humorous but, but still with a, a certain amount of truth. The picture here of the the, the fan-shaped painting with the uh, with the waterfall dropping down that I, I don't, that is not going to be the real Mayan I think something once you notice it the looking the big bulging clips are sort of, it looks like somebody's bottom shall I say well, I'll say that and then quickly go on uh, it's it's a little bit anyway okay next please um, this is the painting in the former Crawford collection now the Met one of that series I showed one before, uh, were very fine paintings that were um, acquired by Crawford from Zhang Da Chen, uh, published long, long ago in an old catalog. I spoke of that. Anyway, uh, a painting of a scholar um, gazing at the moon with a cherry tree, a, 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 a plum tree, I guess it is, a signature, I believe, way over the right, and uh, the usual. This is a little bit too angular and hard. I would rather uh, accept uh, paintings in which the line moves more fluidly. Uh, this, I think, is by some good follower. And there are lots and lots of these good paintings. Uh, anyway, here looking at the, uh, at, the plum, at the plum tree. Yes, now look at, look at the upper part of this. Uh, it, it goes chunk, 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 in one direction or another. Well, this is fine in its way, but I think not quite the real Maliran. And then the transition at a distance uh, uh, through dimmer parts is, again, rather artificial or rather mechanically done. All right, next, please. Here's a painting, a horizontal painting, uh, of solitary angler on the river, fisherman, that is, uh, attributed to Mayuan. This is in the Tokyo National Museum, famous painting in Japan. Well, what this is, is a uh, fragment of what must have been a big hanging scroll uh, which was cut by some Japanese tea master, uh, tea ceremony master from a large hanging scroll, and made into a tokonoma hanging, a small picture. The Japanese love uh, simple pictures they can concentrate on, rather than big pictures which they have to wander over and look at part by part. They don't like that so much. They don't have any facilities for hanging a large hanging scroll anyway, uh, just as they don't really much like the hand scroll form except for narratives in their own traditions on, but at any rate, uh, they like to cut them up and make 
tea ceremony or tokonoma hangs for them. And that's what's happened here. The serious uh, horizontal uh, cracking uh, is, is characteristic of what was originally a, a big hanging scroll, just as you know. Okay, here's a detail from this solitary angler painting, and we see the fisherman concentrating. This may well be the hand of Mayuran. It's uh, very, very be beautifully, strongly drawn. The swirling of the water around the boat is good. And the, obviously the figure, simple as it is, uh, has a lot of sort of life and uh, hot contemplation. Um, okay, the next. Well, here is a painting, I could actually put on many of this type, of a scholar seated on a ledge under a pine tree with his servant gazing at the moon. The moon is up here in the upper right. Okay, there are a lot of later imitations of this kind. This, is, this one is in the Otami Museum, but uh, as I say, I could put on quite a number, another private museum. Um, well, space p plays, you might say, a more positive role in these paintings. They're, they're typically divided between very solid areas and very spacious. Well, we saw that early on in painting associated with Li Tang, but here it reaches sort of extreme. Uh, the, and the figure's attention, the attention of the figures is typically absorbed into this space. One's eye is drawn from solid matter into space. The, art, or the artist persuades us to lose ourselves in it, and somehow the experience has a touch of the mystical. Some people have tried a kind of Zen interp interpretation of this, but it's a diluted mysticism, like romantic poetry in the West. It's done a little too easily to be really convincing. Um, well, you, people have written, I mean, a lot of romantic kind of stuff about Mayuran's paintings. Here is Oswald Seren uh, writing about Mayuran, quote, they reflect ideas that reverberate beyond form and dissolve into space, end quote. Oof, haha, <laughs> that shows you why you can't read Seren with benefit and pleasure anymore. A few more details from paintings ascribed to Mayuran and his followers to expand on this type. I won't even try to identify them, and they're only details from old slides anyway. In the fan painting at the left, the man sits under a pine tree on a mountain ledge, holding out a cup of wine, as if drinking a toast to the moon, while a servant holds a tray with more wine. In the other, in the other one on the right, he sits beneath bamboo, playing the chin, letting its sounds harmonize with the sounds of nature around him. The next, please. Two details here from a fan painting, formerly Crawford Collection, uh, actually attributed to Li Tong, but I think Southern Sung and Date, with two gentlemen gazing at a waterfall. The blue-edged hilltops in the upper right, I think, reveal the Ma Yuan associations. These are typical of him and his followers. Next, please. A leaf representing a man and his servant in a boat beneath willows from a Japanese collection. The mounting and the cracking tell us that and a detail from a different leaf with a man alone in a boat near the shore, gazing off across the water. I could add a great many others. These will serve for our purpose. Okay, let's go on. Um, now, I, I could show lots of those, but I, I won't, because as I say they become a type, they become a little a cliche, and a little too too uh, common. Now, here is a, here's a section from, I don't have this, I do have slides of the whole thing, but I'm not going to show it. Uh, I, I'm going to just refer to it and recommend that you pay attention to the painting, which is reproduced and discussed elsewhere. Uh, this is a very fine hand scroll attributed to Mayuran in the Nelson Gallery in Kansas City. I saw photographs of this long before the original turned up, and uh, I was looking for it. Actually, it was owned by a dealer who had been in Japan, and I tried to contact the dealer and tried to find the painting. And Larry Sigman. Chris Emma was always so good at this, walking by an auction gallery one day, just drops in casually and finds the painting and buys it for Kansas City. Well, I was, I was almost angry with him, but envious. But he did, did that. He was marvelous. And the painting has been written about really very interestingly by his uh, disciple, shall we say, the later director of the Nelson Gallery, Mark Wilson. The section in the Eight Dynasties catalog is a long long, interesting discussion, and a fairly, some, maybe it's also published elsewhere, I don't remember, who has a fairly convincing idea of just the very occasions that might have been, might have been represented. 
uh, someone in Hangzhou, a rich guy who uh, threw parties, and some of them are actually held up on the trees, in a kind of hammock up on the trees, anyway. Um, okay, whatever. This is, a, at any rate, a gathering in which people, uh, scholars, and there's also a Buddhist monk here, uh, are, are at this rich person's villa in the garden, and various things are going on. Here, one of their number is writing an inscription, maybe enshrining their names all in the thing. And um, um, here, a, a detail. Yes, here, closer up. Uh, this could well be Mayan. It's, it's up to his level. Uh, I, I think it's unsigned. The figures are very definitely in the style associated with Mayan. And he did paintings of this kind. Okay, I'm, I'm ready. Here's another detail of it with the monk and the little boy and the others. But interesting figure painting. We saw a figure painting a bit earlier associated with uh, with a late a late North a late Southern Song Academy master, um, and uh, there was rather rather similar. Okay, onward. <clears throat> Here's a painting in Japan, one of three works signed, as I remember. I've never studied them really carefully. Uh, a trib no, only attributed, I guess, to um, to um, Marian. This one is in the um, uh, Tenryuji, a temple in Kyoto. Um, the three original paintings from what was originally a series of five of Chan patriarchs, or Chan meetings, meetings between Chan figures. And they're quite fine pictures. They've been studied by the Japanese, and if I were doing religious painting, I'd take them more seriously. Uh, writing at the top, um, let's see, do I have a detail of that? Yes, here it is. Uh, these are two uh, two patriarchs, um, founders of the Chan sect. Um, the painting is damaged, but enough remains to reveal the high quality of it and the likelihood that it really is a work of, uh, of Maliran. This is another of the group in the Tokyo National Museum representing the Chan monk Dongshan wading a stream. The figure is sensitively portrayed, holding up his robes, and leaning on his staff as he wades across. But even more impressive, I think, is the way the setting is established with minimal means. Simple shoreline with grasses, a, a few rocks, a very simple blue hilltop in the upper right, and how spacious and atmospheric it is nonetheless made to feel. Achieving much with little is typical of Southern Song at its best. The writing above, which is supposed to be by Yang Meiza, appears to be on separate silk suggesting that it was, as in other cases we have, originally mounted separately and not written in the sky as it is now. Okay, here um, now I'll show a series of paintings in the Palace Museum in Beijing, and I have lots of slides of it. I could spend a whole hour talking about this. I used to do that, but I won't, Just, but I'll show a few examples. This is, um, this is the one called Ten Scenes of Water, and it's done for an imperial... Uh, for, for the emperor under whom he served, his, his uh, the seal and a tiny writing over here at the at the left under uh, just to the side of the big title says uh, done for the uh, imperial power or whatever uh, gift to. Uh, at any rate, scenes of water and quite wonderful poetic theme, probably uh, again done for some uh, imperial patron who wrote the uh, titles and then Mao Yuan filled in the pictures. Um, this one is uh, the Long River, that's the Yangtze River. Uh, a myriad, well, Qing is a, uh, a unit of acre, uh, a myriad acres of the Changjiang River. Anyway, waves uh, blown by the wind and by the flow of the water, wonderfully captured. Uh, here is one, uh, another, another one, uh, the cloud something and the, and the cur curving waves. Um, anyway, a wonderful wave. One might be reminded of Hoxha is great. Not, it's not quite much as big as that, but still a very strong wave. And here's a detail of it. Fine brushwork, uh, a fine a decorative capturing of the power of water. And it's, it's an amazing series and that nobody in the West, I would think, would, would think of trying to draw paint uh, anything quite so subtle as this. Here next is the uh, 
the uh, light on the light on the lake, Huguang, blank blank. I can't read them anyway. I don't know what those characters mean. Don't write and tell me. Um, with evening light in the distance, it's like a painting of Ma Lin. We'll see you later. Evening scene and soft waves uh, on the water. Well, it, there must be a lot of observation behind this and a lot of sketches. Uh, next, please. There's another one in the Palace Museum in Taipei of this subject. Not as good, really. Now remember, well, never mind. Um, Dongting Lake Dongting, which is a lake in uh, Hunan Province. Uh, feng Shi, fine wind. In other words, the uh, fine waves uh, made by the wind on Lake Dongting. Not, not flowing. And here's a detail of that. Well, I've shown several slides by Southern Sioux Academy artists that are simply pattern, and yet they can make even pattern interesting, something which could turn so easily into a mechanical repetition and become dull and flat, and instead it becomes interesting. You're absorbed into the hand of the artist, but also the image made by the hand of the artist. And here, another one, uh, the Huanghe, the Yellow River, and uh, something flowing. Uh, anyway, whatever that means. Um, and again, a po quite powerful waves. So the paintings, and with some co uh, white color added, uh, or bluish white color to them to give, give more strength to the image. Um, wonderful pictures. Somebody should maybe write a long study of these, translating all the titles I can't do, and, and identifying them, and and maybe somebody who really understands the actual uh, what uh, scientific movement and uh, vicissitudes, so to speak, of water should write about this. They're very much worth worth more time than I'm giving it. Uh, now then, going on, well, just rather briefly, I'll show a painting by Ma Yuan, I think is genuine, which we discovered when we were doing the photographing and going through the paintings. And this one has never been published or looked at. As, I mean, obviously it was looked at, but not in recent centuries. No attention paid to it, say. It's a signed work. I don't remember where the signature is. But it represents a Taoist magician riding on a dragon with a servant. I should say there are, oh, more paintings by Ma Yuan and his son Ma Lin that I'm not showing of portraits of ancient people and all kinds. They could do anything. They were just endlessly versatile, especially Ma Yuan. So anyway, this is a signed work in the Palace Museum in Taipei, a little noticed or almost unnoticed painting. I don't know if it's ever been, ever been uh, reproduced uh, or uh, what uh, uh, exhibited, maybe. Um, anyway, a, a, but a genuine work. And here is the Taoist magician riding through the clouds on his dragon. Here he, here he is up close, a quite strong face, old fellow, and the dragon, dragon with its claws. Uh, behind him, uh, and here the his demon servant down below, as if running through the space. Mm, quite fine. Okay, enough of that. Um, now I showed briefly when I was talking about bird and flower painting in the tenth lecture. Um, this painting, I think, and maybe others uh, associated with Marianne. Now this is a painting here uh, now on the screen. Um, which was first published, as far as I know, way back in the early in the century in the auction catalog of a famous collector of that time who had, Akaboshi was it, I can't, I can't remember. Okay, uh, who, who had paintings that later turned into important cultural properties or really national treasures, really big things. This painting went into a private collection, the private collection of the uh, electrical magnate Matsushita, as I remember, and was in his private museum. And some Japanese authority comes along and looks at it and says, no, that's not really my, um, that's an imitation. And Japanese scholarship being what it is and the, uh, the what, power of, of, the, uh, of, of the authority's voice, the grand authority being what it is in Japan, nobody ever paid attention to it after that. And eventually uh, paintings from this museum after the old guy died were sold by his son, or rather given to uh, dealers to reward them for having helped the father. And this one went to a certain dealer I knew very well, and um, I, I, he showed it to me, 
And he said, here's a uh, Ming imitation of Myra. And I looked at it a while and I said, but wait now, uh, Takahashi-san, this is, this is a genuine Myra, I think. I said, you can't sell it. How, can you sell this to me so cheap? And he said, well, I'll sell you something uh, expensive next time. That's sure. So I bought it for very little and eventually gave it to the, uh, sold it to, excuse me, the uh, Net, uh, our University Art Museum, and it's there now. It has a Mayuran signature down at the bottom, middle bottom, a bit cut off, but seemingly quite genuine, and everything in it for me uh, absolutely matches. It's a picture of, uh, I matches other Mayuran and have really good paintings. A picture of ducks, there's a mother duck and ducklings down in the lower right, a plum tree growing from a rock. The painting has been cut off at the bottom, which gives it less, uh, which somewhat uh, disturbs the composition a bit. The rocks seem to sit too heavily in the composition. And then going back to slopes of hills, one still textured a little bit and darker, one further back uh, just in silhouette, and a, uh, a, a rope of clouds or mist floating between them. Absolutely ideal Maran type composition for me anyway. I am I was totally sold on this painting and I believe it's the real thing. Here is the here close up is the bit with the ducks and the tree. Here you see the tree is not done in sort of stark, harsh, uh, straight lines, but uh, as it's quite a flex flexible uh, running uh, line and I think this is the hand of the real master. The uh, rock which is textured I haven't talked about Maoyan rocks much. If I had, I would show that they were, they tended to be done in large axe cut sun or texture strokes, some of them, and which are limited for maybe to one side of the rock and more and more sense of highlight and shadow as the rock is it seen and the old tree clinging to the rock. Uh, now, in the Palace Museum in Beijing, next please, here is a, there's an album leaf, famous album leaf, signed by Marian, which is uh, has a similar plum tree and similar geese. This is just a, a um, album leaf. But here again you see a big rock on the right with just a little bit of texturing, not so strong, and uh, more sense of light and shadow. All the uh, what effects of the Li Tong style carried further. And the plum tree in this case hangs down from the upper part and the ducks are swimming around in the water. Here's a detail of the plum tree, again one that is done in this fluid uh, line drawing, not stark and harsh and angular, uh, so but blossoming tree going from the left, and here is the group of ducks, the mother duck and ducklings, quite lovely, and beautiful drawing of the swirling water around them. Uh, anyway, that I think is the real thing. Uh, here is the yeah, there are several others, so this might have been a kind of minor specialty of Ma Yuan, that is, landscapes with birds, seasonal landscapes with birds, or particular kinds of plants. In the Palace Museum, next please. Palace Museum in Taipei is this one, winter scene with an old, um, old uh, tree and a, a bird roosting in it up there, and some little bits of bamboo and so on, and big rock with snow. And down below, egrets, white birds, uh, cold by a, by a running stream. Quite fine, atmospheric. I don't have good slides, so I won't speak of it at length. Now, next please. In the Yamato Bunkakan, a smaller painting, also quite fine, also signed, and I think genuine, Ma Yuan, of, in this case, a, a stream and rock and bamboo and swallows. Well, a swallow in flight and two of them perched on the on the tree uh, and mist behind. Really lovely little paintings and they seem reliable to me, reliable works of Maran, signed works. And they make up a group which I think deserves some attention in itself and uh, of which the Berkeley painting, the Berkeley painting is, is reproduced in my Sogenga catalog by the way, if you want to find it. Uh, here for by contrast, I'll put this on just to finish this group, uh, a painting in the this is one in the um, uh, in the Eight Dynasties catalog, Eight Dynasties number 54, bought by Sherman Lee. Sherman Lee didn't make many mistakes, uh, like Larry Sickman. Uh, he, he did extremely well, but I think this was a mistake. It may be more impressive in the original Darker Silk than in the, the reproduction. 
Uh, but in the reproduction, certainly, it's, it's, it seems quite impossible. The river flowing out of distance uh, flows on the surface and sort of works decoratively as a decorative flat uh, surface, uh, as it does in Ming painting. And uh, generally, the mist is not really that convincing. The bamboo stalks are crossing in a way that is, could be a textbook example of what and how, how not to paint bamboo stalks. And um, perhaps most damning of all, the ducks, uh, two of them up here behind the, print, the, the foreground bamboo stalk, are on this slope, which is sloping almost vertically. So if they were really up there, they'd fall off, obviously. Uh, rather absurd. Another duck down below looking up. A painting that is quite clearly uh, Ming imitation and not not the real Marianne. The, the space doesn't work, the bamboo, well, okay, I don't say it all again. Now then, finally, I'll end after that uh, less than perfect painting, I'll end with one that is somewhere close to perfect. This is actually not attributed to Marianne at all. It's uh, a, a painting uh, called the Han Palace, a fan painting, as you see here. Here it is up close uh, in the hole. And it's actually attributed to Zhao Bo Ju, who's the early Southern Song uh, painter who did blue and green landscapes. We saw a wonderful long hand scroll or details from it by him, or it's attributed to him. But this attribution does not early at all. It was actually made by the late Ming artist uh, Dong Chi Chang, artist and theorist and so forth. Well, Dong Chi Chang, uh, people of that age, we have to respect them. They didn't have you know, photographs and reproductions the way they did, the way we do. They went around and they kept in their memory memories of paintings they had seen and they tried to tell collectors as they went around who painted the pictures they had. So Dong Chi Chang comes up with the name of Zhao Bo Chu, but that's, that makes no sense. Actually, the uh, distant hills and the willows and other things in this one remind me much more of Mao Yuan. So if I were to choose a name, it would be Mao Yuan. At any rate, it's a fan painting, very beautiful, reproduced in color in the Chinese art treasures and the Skira book and uh, so forth, possessing the past, it was there. A little painting, only nine and a half inches wide, but lots going on in it. Now, I have good details of this, starting here in the foreground. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's a, it's a mid-autumn festival, and... Um, uh, and, and people are gathering to gaze at the moon. Uh, and you see uh, here in the, in the foreground, in this uh, detail, you see the chariots and ox, uh, oxen pull, who pulled an ox cart and the grooms. Anyway, the servants uh, in a roped, in a sort of uh, roped off or uh, uh, shielded area uh, in, the, in the foreground, waiting for the people they've brought. There's the actual palace ladies who have come for this, uh, invited by the uh, empress, presumably, and the high-ranking ladies. Here they are seen making their way through a palace of which the interior is lit, much the same way as in the Maoyuan uh, painting that we saw at the beginning. So this, again, strengthens the idea that it may really be by him. And as in that painting, the remainder of the painting has a wonderful twilight uh, effect of a garden. And here the, we see the ladies of highest rank, tallest, uh, accompanied by their servants carrying fans, making their way slowly along, the, um, <clears throat> along this uh, walkway uh, toward the tower where they will climb and gather to, uh, to gaze at the moon. In the, inside the palace uh, building behind, there is a big coral at the left here, red, and various... Uh, of bronze or ceramic objects lined up there for them to enjoy and so on. And comfortable seats and places for them to sit. Now, okay, next please. <clears throat> now, uh, here further on, we see the rest of the procession. Uh, these are these are quite beautiful Southern Song ladies. Uh, slim and delicate, uh, wish, uh, sort of pla pla pliable, shall we say. Uh, behind them, banana palm trees and huge rocks. This is a palace garden. And they are making their way through a, a hole, a, a, a entryway in the rocks uh, to, to climb, them, climb into this tower. Now here on the left side, we see 
uh, we see uh, people climbing the tower and servants up above who are already there, sort of waiting and preparing for them. Uh, the, the, the rendering of evening is quite wonderful throughout the whole painting. In the upper right of this slide, by the way, you see something that you might not immediately recognize if you uh, aren't familiar with Southern Song or old Chinese paintings, and palace paintings especially. What it actually with two flags, uprights, and then cross pieces. What that actually is is the top of a frame from which a, sw a swing would be hung, a long rope swing. And sometimes you see the actual swings. Palace ladies in Song China, southern Song China anyway, loved swinging on these long swings. Uh, this, is, this is a practice carried on in Korea. Korean ladies love to swing in, in their beautiful, uh, colorful costumes. Well, I don't know whether just what the implications were. I don't know. If, I don't know. I've never seen anything that suggests that they were gazed at by male viewers who looked up their dresses, <laughs> like the painting, the European paintings of swinging. I'm the great uh, Fragonard uh, wall paintings in the Frick Gallery in New York, for instance, where there's definitely, it's definitely erotic. Not so in China. I think it's just a very elegant pastime for ladies. Okay, let's go on. And here, the upper side of the the upper part of the painting, with an inscription uh, by the Chenlong Emperor again, as always. Um, and uh, is there actually a moon here? Anyway, the, the distant hills, as you see, are quite reminiscent of Maoyuan and the painting of the willow trees in the upper right and the, what, plum trees in the lower, in the, in the left. Uh, anyway, a very beautiful painting and quite remarkable that the artist has so much going on in it in this very small space. Richard Edwards' book, The Heart of Ma Yuan, The Search for a Southern Song Aesthetic, was finally published late last year by the University of Hong Kong Press. It was long and gestating. Dick had planned a major exhibition of Southern Song Academy painting back in the 1980s that was never realized, and this book must be a late outcome of that project. The book certainly merits our attention as an important new contribution to our subject. Next, please. So I want to rededicate this lecture to Dick Edwards, taken on the trip we all took after the Anhui School Symposium of 1984. He's the central figure in a group that also includes Zhu Jing Li and Bill Wu at the left, Jonathan Hay and Jason Guo at the right, myself behind them. Dick has always been a person of boundless energy and goodwill, and I've enjoyed his friendship over more than 60 years since I first met him in 1950. <clears throat> Next, please. I left out before, for lack of good sides, this pair, a fan painting convincingly ascribed to Maguan, and the calligraphy fan that it was painted to accompany. The pair is in the Osaka Municipal Museum, and I published and discussed it in my book, The Lyric Journey, pages 28 to 29, as a surviving example of painting and the accompanying poem from the Southern Sioux Academy. The painting is titled Evening Landscape with Buildings and Tall Pines. The calligraphy is by Emperor Guangzong, who reigned 1189 to 1194. It's a quatrain by the late Tang poet Bo Yi, and in the translation by Charles Mason, it reads, <clears throat> Below the silk thread pavilion, that is where the imperial rescripts were drafted, silence among the letters and documents, bells and drums within the tower, the clepsydra shows the lateness. Sitting alone in the dusky twilight, who will be my companion? Crepe myrtle flowers, face to face with an administrative secretary. End of the quatrain. So this palace functionary is imagined as sitting alone in the evening, listening to the drums and bells, announcing the hour, and wondering how he will spend the evening. A very contemporary sounding problem. Ma Yuan, of course, shows him only as a tiny figure seen on the terrace of the palace building in far lower left. His picture is mostly about the pine tree dramatically silhouetted against the evening sky, the rock below, the further trees and the distant hills, and the evening sky itself. Has that mild melancholy of twilight ever been more movingly captured? Ma Yuan positions his figure so that he seems to face in the wrong direction, to see only part of the scene that's presented to us. Like so many others of his paintings, this one raises again the question, whose feelings are we made to feel here? 
Bao Juiz, the imagined bureaucrats, Emperor Guangzhong's, Mao Yuan's. I raise this question in my book, and I try to deal with it there. It's the same question raised by the musicologist Edward Cohn in his book, The Composer's Voice, based on the lectures that he gave in Berkeley as the Ernest Bloch lecturer around 1980. I got to know him well during his year there, and I had him and, my, and his students to my house for listening to a rare Schubert recording if they couldn't otherwise hear. He asked in his lectures, when we listen to a Schubert song, whose voice are we hearing? That of the poet Heinrich Heine, whose poem Schubert set, or the young man in his poem singing to his lady love, or Schubert's, or that of the singer, ideally for Schubert leader, the great baritone Gerhard Hoosh. I only raise the question again as one basic to theories of expression in the arts. Next, please. Back to Mayuan. There are many paintings ascribed to him in Japan that I know only from old reproductions. This is one of them. A painting I'd really love to see, but I have no idea where it is, or even if it still survives. It's a fine example of a late Song landscape type. I'll talk about in my lecture on Liang Kai, who uses it for several of his paintings. The upper part of the composition is occupied by an overhanging cliff, and we look beneath it to see the main subject of the picture, a recluse seated at the opening to his cave dwelling. He sits at a stone table, his boy's servant near him. A pine tree is set against the cliff, and below it a smaller bear tree, with the entrance to a smaller cave at lower left. If this is indeed by Maran, it expands the range of his compositions and shows him as an innovator in a new type of landscape with figures. I should say before continuing that problems of authenticity among the paintings ascribed to Maran are formidable. He had a great many close followers and imitators because his paintings were popular and in demand in Japan as well as in China. My own attempt to deal with this problem is in the nine and a half pages devoted to him in my old index of early Chinese painters and paintings. Eventually, I hope some young scholar will take on Ma Yuan as a dissertation and publication project and devote years to these paintings. This lecture is only a small contribution towards such a project. Next, please. This painting ascribed to Ma Yuan, of which I have only this image made from a reproduction, is in the Shanghai Museum and is titled Heralding the New Year. The scene it shows is familiar, in a way, from lots of later New Year's pictures. I write about them in one of my books, in which people are shown coming to somebody's house for visits during the New Year's season, according to custom. In this case, the scene is happening outside a palace building. Paintings of this kind were made in the Academy for presentation, and this one might well have been done to accompany a piece of imperial calligraphy presented to some high official on New Year's. It would then be similar in purpose to the Banquet by Lantern Light, which I showed and spoke about at length earlier in this lecture. My memory of this painting, which is confirmed by this reproduction, is that it's a fine work, quite possibly by Maguren. It lets the viewer move back through the successive spaces into the palace building, even to the covered walkway at its right that leads further back. I wish I had details that would allow us to see the figures and allow me to talk about them. Next, please. Before I continue with looking at other kinds of Maguyan paintings, however, let me add one more picture of the familiar subject, a scholar and his servant in a landscape, but one that's new to me. It seems quite fine and may well be important. This is a painting in the Liaoning Museum, reproduced in a new book I recently received. According to the accompanying text, it was published by their former director, Yang Run Kai, back in 1989, but I somehow missed it. It's a landscape of figures, 122 centimeters, or about a meter and a quarter in height, ink and colors on silk, with an inscription at the top written by Emperor Ningzong, who, were, who ruled from 1195 to 1224. The period is right, that is, for the active period of Ma Yuan. Uh, according to this inscription, which appears to be written on a separate piece of silk, but the top of the pine tree sticks up into it, confirming that the two belong together. According to this inscription, the painting was done as an imperial gift for the birthday of someone named Wang Du to wish him long life. The auspicious pine, of course, has that meaning. That symbolism and that use of the painting may help to explain why so many paintings of this subject were done. There were lots of birthdays that needed presents. 
The noble scholar in this one sits on a rock bench, looking upward into the pine branches. His boy servant, wearing a cape of leaves, looks down at two auspicious linger fungi that he has picked. These also represent wishes for long life. Beyond at the left we see green stalks of bamboo growing, and a railing leading downward into a misty valley. Pay attention to the dien or dots along the edge of the cliff, done in the late sung manner, each black dot with a touch of mineral green in the center. We've seen these already in several late sung paintings, and we'll see them again. The recession into far distance is accomplished in a way consistent with Moliran's other works. A fully shaped and volumetrically rendered rocky cliff in the foreground is echoed further back by one with simpler and paler surface treatment, and then still further back by flat shapes rendered only as silhouettes with shaded washes growing paler and fainter. All in all, this seems convincing as a fine work by Marian, and one that interestingly foreshadows the better-known larger picture painted by his son Ma Lin in 1246, listening to the wind in the pines, which we'll look at at length in Lecture 11C. Next, please. This, a horizontal picture that's a kind of double album leaf, is in the National Palace Museum in Taipei, and appears to me to be a copy after a fine work that may well have been a genuine Ma Yuan, similarly done to accompany a piece of calligraphy in the same horizontal form. The seal seen on the lower right corner is the famous Suyin half seal, which, if genuine, would make the painting no later than the early Ming, when it was stamped on, the, on a group of imperial level paintings, half of the seal on each of the paintings, the other half on an inventory sheet. Usually it's an indicator of real age and quality. But the drawing here is too hard, the forms too mannered, the flowing stream too much confined to the picture plane, to allow the picture to be of early date in the work of a great master. The noble scholar here sits beneath the usual pine tree, accompanied by the usual boy servant. He gazes at two birds seen at right, one flying over the stream, the other perched on a stone stand probably eating bird seed that he has placed there to attract the birds. Next. One can imagine the truly relaxed and elegant figure the original artist must have drawn, a figure more like the one we just saw in the Pine of Longevity picture. There, the cylindricality of his tree trunk, the strong three-dimensional shaping of the rock, the way the smaller stream flowed out of real distance, all worked visually, but none of them quite work here. Even the upward-pointing leaves of ground plants that stick up above the rocks are repetitive and heavy-handed. We would like to have the original of this one. Next, please. Here are two album leaves, ascribed to Myran, shown in reproductions from an auction catalog. I don't have original slides. These were in the collection of Stephen Junkins, spelled J-U-N-C-U-N-C, -U -U but pronounced Junkins, I think. He was an eccentric Chicago collector, whom I once visited through the arrangement of Father Harry van der Stoppen, who accompanied me. We spent quite a few hours in his house, from early evening into post-midnight hours, being shown his paintings, but also listening to an endless harangue from him about how great the paintings were, about the strange ways he had acquired them, how he could tell the age of paper because he was a scientist, and so forth. When we were finally freed, I remember that Harry and I ran down the street, jumping into the air and shouting to relieve our long, pent-up spirits. It was a very strange experience. Anyway, back to the Mayuan paintings, um, the Mayuan attributed paintings. I recall being struck by the unusual and interesting composition of the one at left, in which the gentleman scholar sits at the edge of his garden by the pond, perhaps waiting for birds or animals to come. The one at right is more conventional where he is understood to be in the open room of a palace building at evening, gazing out over the willows and further buildings, and up at the full moon and the evening sky, with the usual pine tree set against the distant hill above him. Looked at again in these reproductions, the evening scene looks fine and old, while the other one, the pond-side scene, looks interesting and original uh, as a picture, but is too much made up of flat forms, the rocks, the leafy trees, the distant hills, too much to be believable as the work of a master or of the Sung period. It must be a good copy of a fine work. Next, please. A fan-shaped leaf titled Conversation in a Cave, 
an unsigned work attributed to Marianne in the Metropolitan Museum of Art, or so says the label on the slide from which I copy this. It isn't in either of either one Fong's Beyond Representation book or in my old index for some reason. The acquisition number is in 1947, so it must be in the Barr collection, which didn't contain all that much of genuinely early material. This one, seen now, looks early and fine. The composition is of a type mentioned earlier, in which we look beneath an overhanging cliff, its upper part covered in mist that occupies the upper part of the composition. Two pine trees and some leafy bushes grow from the top of the cave entrance and are silhouetted against the mist. Inside the cave, two men, a white-robed scholar gentleman and a blue-robed recluse, sit facing each other in the familiar pairing. The scholar has come to visit the old recluse and obtain some words of wisdom from him. His boy servant waits outside just past the bridge over a small stream. The drawing is supple, the forms occupy space, the sides of the cave entrance are shaped so as to read as tactile surfaces as, in the huge ro as is the huge rock outside. Even the glimpse of cliffside and rushing stream seen below the mist at far right is believable, carrying our gaze further back. If this leaf bore a signature, I would be ready to accept it as the work by the master. It has been neglected by all of us and deserves more attention. Next, please. In this fan-shaped painting at left, which is taken from some old Japanese book, I can't tell you which, the noble scholar sits near the edge of his garden terrace, watching a crane or egret that is perched on a small tree just outside his garden. On the stone stand to the left of him is what is probably a container of bird seed put there to attract the birds. He sits very quietly, watching. This was one of the ideal occupations for gentlemen in retirement, and is often depicted in paintings, especially those by Maluan. They may have been presented to court officials who dreamed of this kind of leisure in retirement. The other fan-shaped leaf at right depicts a similar scene, but here we watch as a deer that has come to drink in the stream. This one belonged to my friend, the collector Chung Chi, who lived most of the time in Tokyo and acquired good Chinese paintings in Japan. This painting, with its sensitive treatment of the distant hills and other familiar materials, appears convincing as a late sum work. The attribution, made in a title label in upper right, is not to Maluan, but to a lesser known minor late sum artist named Ye Xiaoyan, a painter from Hangzhou who was active in the mid 13th century and is recorded as having imitated Maluan. Next, please. And in fact, another version of the same composition is indeed ascribed to Maluan himself. It's one of the paintings I used to represent him in my Scarab book. It was then in the collection of C.C. Wong. Later it was acquired by the Cleveland Museum of Art, and it's number 52 in the Eight Dynasties catalog. Howard Rogers, writing the entry for it there, notes the existence of the Ye Xiaoyan leaf with the same composition, and he quotes information on Ye from the a Yuan period compilation, Tu Hui Bao Jian, including the comment that he was, quote, especially skilled in copy drawing. Howard adds perceptibly, as always, quote, while that attributed to Ye Xiaoyan preserves the general features of Ma Yuan's composition, the addition of distant peaks in the upper left eliminates the tensions which associate the present painting with the essence of Ma Yuan's art, end quote. I leave the relationship, indeed the age and authenticity of both paintings, somewhat open. Next, please. Finally, for Maluan, this image of the lower part of what must be a fan-shaped leaf. It's made from an old slide, and I can't identify the collection or even show you the whole. I showed it briefly earlier in this lecture, and I now bring it back as a fitting ending for this presentation of a great master. Our noble scholar sits on a rocky ledge under the familiar pine tree, his servant beside him with a tray of edibles, a wine gourd on the table behind for replenishing the cup that he holds out in one hand, drinking a toast. Toast to, to what? The moon, like we bore, we buy. Uh, just to the evening sky and distant hills. Without the upper part, we can't know whether there was a moon. There probably was, so he may be drinking a toast to the moon. But the theme or sense of the picture is clear. It's a toast or a tribute to lateness, to the past to things far away and remembered. That theme underlies a lot of Maluan's painting, 
and a lot of Sun Ren Chung painting generally, along with a theme of returning home, which also implies lateness. Should we understand the pervasiveness of this theme in the context of the historical situation of late Southern Chung people, who could not have been unaware of their precarious position occupying a small and vulnerable area menaced by powerful forces in the north who would soon invade and end their dynasty? I don't think we're over-reading Mai Ren's paintings when we detect some such feeling behind them. I'll return to this theme of lateness and return in lectures to come in connection with paintings by Xia Gui and Ma Lin. I raise it and discuss it also in my Lyric Journey book, both in the chapter on Southern Song and in the one on the Japanese master Yosa Busan. It's a theme that runs through these lectures on Southern Song and that resonates with me as an old person appalled by what has happened to his country, to the world around him, feeling that he has somehow stayed up very late. For now, this ends our consideration of Ma Yuan, a great and undervalued master.